Say hello to my big friends. I have six network attached storage devices. Welcome to NASA Palooza. Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is David Gewertz. You are watching ZDNet's DIY IT series. This time we're focusing on network attached storage. And I am surrounded by network attached storage devices. A few months ago, I wrote a battle of the desktop NAS articles and all of the other NAS providers decided to come out of the woodwork and send me NASs to take a look at. And so that's what we're gonna do. I have six NASs, one, two, three, four, five, and this monster back here, which you can't even see my hand, and a pile of extra drives that Western Digital was kind enough to send me for testing. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna rip this thing apart and see what we have. It's time for Speed Run. actually reinforced NAS. I have no idea if I can even get this thing unpacked without hurting myself or anybody else. It is fireproof. It is designed to withstand conflagration. It is made of rock and brick. And it is heavy as all get out. Well, that was fun. After all the chaos from the unboxing, I've pulled together the six NAS devices here on the bench. Let's run through each of them and learn where they're the same and how they differ. Before we get started, I wanna note that I'm looking at hardware features today just to give you a view of what to look for in the NAS devices you might purchase. We'll look at software and data protection features in future videos. Let's kick it off with the Synology Disk Station 1817 Plus. This is an eight bay version of the Synology NAS I looked at a few months ago. This machine also has four gigabit ethernet ports, four USB 3.0 ports, and two eSATA ports. Additionally, this NAS supports a PCIe card, which allows additional features like flash storage and 10 gigabit ethernet, along with additional drive bays. Next up is the QNAB TVS473. While all these NASs provide media center functions, often by offering the ability to serve video to Plex, QNAP takes it a step further by putting media center ports on the unit. That means this device is designed to sit next to your big screen TV as a standalone server, complete with all the audio and video outputs you might need, including dual HDMI ports. It even has an IR port so you can use the included remote control to turn on and off media playback. This is a four bay machine with four gigabit ethernet ports and four USB 3.0 ports. Interestingly, this device also adds two of the much higher speed USB 3.1 ports, but in the type A plug configuration. Our next box is the Buffalo Terra Station 5410DN. This is another four bay machine, but its most noticeable feature is that in addition to two gigabit ethernet ports, it has a native built-in 10 gigabit ethernet port. Let's talk for a moment about that. This is a bit ahead of its time, especially if you're doing media production on Macs like I do. No Mac out now supports 10 gigabit ethernet natively. There are some enthusiast motherboards on the PC side that do support 10 gigabit ethernet. Plus to use 10 gig E, your switches and routers will also need to support the added speed. Even though I don't have a 10 gig E infrastructure right now, it's exciting to see where this is going. 
Kudos to Buffalo for building this feature in as a native element of the product. Next is the smallest NAS of our set today. This is the NAS F2420. It's less expensive than the other NAS devices, and even though it's only got two bays, it still has two gigabit ethernet ports. The odd thing about this machine is that in addition to the one USB 3.0 part, this box has an old school USB 2.0 port. I'm not exactly sure why you'd want that unless you were trying to support some very old thumb drives. But hey, that's why we're looking at a whole variety of machines. Each fits a different set of needs. That brings us to the Western Digital MyCloud PR4100, another four bay machine. This device also has two gigabit ethernet ports and three USB 3.0 ports. It's becoming clear that in this generation of NAS devices, two ethernet ports, each supporting gigabit performance, is becoming table stakes. An interesting feature of the MyCloud device is what the company calls a one-touch download button. The idea is you plug in an external drive or camera, hit the button, and the files or photos download straight into the NAS without the need for moving them to and from a computer. It's an interesting idea, and if you've gotten into a workflow, it might be really cool. I'm still more comfortable selecting the files I want to move, but this could be a time saver in certain circumstances. And that brings us to the 70 pound gorilla in the room, the IOSA 1515 Plus. This is a beast. I've got to tell you, after it arrived and I realized how heavy it was, I started to wonder what I'd gotten myself into. But there's a reason for why this thing weighs as much as a box of bricks. It's basically a box of bricks. This thing is designed to survive fire and flood. It's rated to survive up to 1550 degrees Fahrenheit for a full 30 minutes and full submersion up to 10 feet for up to three days. For the record, I wanted to try to blow this thing up and see how it performed, but both my wife and the local fire department vetoed that idea quite firmly. The IOSAFE is essentially a Synology box. It runs the disk station software under license from Synology. The difference is this box is designed to save your data. So once you make it through the apocalypse, you can still file your taxes, play your tunes, and stream your favorite movies. So there you go. There's a lot more to these things, especially when we start to look at the software involved, the relationship to the cloud, management tools, disaster recovery, and more. And with that, I'm David Gewertz for ZDNet's DIY IT. Thanks for joining us for Nazapalooza. If you want to be notified when more videos in this series become available, hit the subscribe button. If you liked what you saw and want to share that joy, go ahead and mash the like button. It'll make you feel warm inside. Have a great day.